Good morning and welcome to another edition of the Sunday History Rewind. I'm your host Jim Lumley. Today we're going to talk about religion in America and why today most of our churches in the United States of America are locked. They're not going to have worship services. We're in the midst of a global pandemic and what power does the government have to tell people that they cannot gather for worship? We're also going to talk about the question of, is America a Christian nation? Uh, Were we founded in Judeo-Christian ethics? Uh, The answer I would submit to the first question constitutionally is no, America is not a Christian nation. We're a democratic republic. We are We are governed by the United States Constitution. Now, it doesn't mean that America is not a nation that was as deeply rooted in Judeo-Christian ethic. We see that throughout our founding history. It's abundantly clear. And we also culturally are still a very uh, Judeo-Christian nation. But because of the Constitution, all religions are put on an equal footing and the government cannot give a preference to any particular religion. Uh, We will do a vlog coming up, I think, probably this summer as we get close to 4th of July, a little bit more uh, longer uh, program that will talk about religion in America and separation of church and state. Uh, And I want to give you some facts and education on that. But for now, why are churches not open in America? And what power does the government have to tell churches they can't uh, gather or worship? If you joined our Facebook Live on Friday, you You heard me talk about that, COVID-19 and the Bill of Rights. Um, The fact is that government has no authority over the churches. And because of that separation of church and state and our Constitution, in the First Amendment, it says Congress shall make no law uh, with respect to establishing a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now, today in my state and around America, many churches are uh, going to resist that order and they're going to meet. Uh, are we going to have law enforcement officers uh, placing a lock on our churches? Uh, are they going to go in and arrest members? Are they going to arrest clergy and drag them out of the church in handcuffs? I hope not. We will see today what happens. But in essence, we, ru- we must remember that our Constitution places the shackles on the government. The people are free uh, to, to live in Um, in America as we see fit and especially to worship as we see fit. So today I'd like to show you a short um, eight-minute video clip from the Widener Historical Group. It's really good and it talks about the faith of our founding fathers and there's 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 this debate that uh, some would argue that our founders were all deist. Um, Some of them were deist like uh, say Thomas Jefferson but many of them like Sam Adams and James Madison and James Wilson were Christians. They They came from a very Uh, religious uh, family. And then there were others like Benjamin Franklin that weren't very religious at all. So the answer to that question is that uh, our founding fathers were a mix. And there were great debates at the Constitutional Convention back 233 years ago this month. But they came up with a compromise and that was in the Constitution. And I think it's worked very well for about 233 years. Don't you agree? Enjoy this video clip and uh, have a great Sunday wherever you are and be safe. God bless America. Everybody has an opinion on the religion of the Founding Fathers. For people who've been dead over 200 years, their beliefs and their intentions still cause controversy. And I was saying then, I'm saying now, that if we, in fact, change all the rules on which this uh, Judeo-Christian nation was built, we cannot expect the Lord to put his shield of protection around us as he has in the past. Christopher, let's start with you. Let me ask you a question. What does it mean, if anything, when people refer to the United States of America as a Christian nation? It's literally a meaningless statement. I mean, the Constitution quite deliberately forbids all mention of God. Well, I should say omits all mention of God, let alone of Jesus. And the, though the Declaration of Independence mentions a creator, it very specifically doesn't say that this creator intervenes. Most of the people who wrote the Declaration were deists, not theists.
Christian nation, Judeo-Christian nation, secular nation. What did the founders believe? What were their policies about religion and state? The beliefs of the founders covered a spectrum from evangelical piety to deism. The most radical of the founders was one of the most pious. When Samuel Adams was a college student at Harvard, he was converted by the preaching of George Whitefield, the cross-eyed English evangelist. Adams was a passionate believer all his life. It informed his radical views of history and politics. He wrote in exasperation. It was asked in the reign of Charles II of England, how shall we turn the minds of the people from an attention to their liberties? The answer was, by making them extravagant, luxurious, and effeminate. Will men never be free? They will be free no longer than while they remain virtuous. Benjamin Franklin was a more complicated character. He was Whitefield's publisher, and he knew Cotton Mather. But he also knew Voltaire, and belonged to the Hellfire Club, an English group that dabbled in blasphemy and orgies. During a deadlock in the Constitutional Convention, he called for the appointment of a clergyman to pray for guidance. Alexander Hamilton supposedly joked that we shouldn't call in foreign help. At the end of Franklin's life, the Reverend Ezra Stiles, president of Yale College, asked what he believed. Franklin answered, Here is my creed. I believe in one God, that he governs the universe by his providence, that he ought to be worshipped, that the most acceptable service is doing good to his other children, that the soul of man is immortal. As to Jesus of Nazareth, I have some doubts as to his divinity, though it is a question I do not busy myself with now when I expect soon an opportunity of knowing the truth with less trouble. Franklin ended by asking Stiles not to publish his letter. I have ever let others enjoy their religious sentiments. I hope to go out of the world in peace with them all. A lot went on in that head, and Franklin wanted to keep a lot of it private. One of Franklin's many protégés was the English radical Thomas Paine, who became an outlier of unbelief. Paine's writing during the American Revolution quoted the Bible, that the Almighty hath here entered his protest against monarchical government is true, or the scripture is false. When he moved to France during its revolution, he attacked all scripture. What is it that the Bible teaches us? Rapine, cruelty, and murder. What is it that the Testament teaches us? That the Almighty committed debauchery with a woman engaged to be married. Paine was not an atheist, as Teddy Roosevelt later called him, but he became a crusading anti-Christian. When he moved back to America, Samuel Adams criticized him for it. When I heard that you had turned your mind to a defense of infidelity, I felt myself much astonished and more grieved. Paine stepped too far outside the norm. His unconversion virtually destroyed his reputation in America. But Americans were less interested in the personal beliefs of the founders than in their policies. What would they do about religion as lawmakers and politicians? The founders all agreed on two points. First, rights were an aspect of human nature established by God. The Declaration of Independence said that all men are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights and that Americans were claiming the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. Second, all men should enjoy free exercise of religion. In 1790, President Washington wrote a letter to the Hebrew congregation in Newport, Rhode Island. At that time, Jews were less than one-twentieth of one percent of the population. Washington told the Jews of Newport that the new government did not practice toleration, 
because toleration implied one class of people doing a favor for another. Instead, Americans enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. So much for religion and law. But what about religion and politics? Here, the founders disagreed. In 1796, in his farewell address, President Washington called religion and morality pillars of human happiness and props of the duties of men and citizens. But in 1802, President Jefferson expressed a different view. He wrote a Baptist congregation in Danbury, Connecticut, praising the First Amendment as building a wall of separation between church and state. Both presidents were amateur architects. One looked to religion as a pillar and prop of good politics. The other wanted a wall between religion and politics. As a practical politician, Jefferson took religious support where he could get it. He and the Danbury Baptists had a common enemy. The Baptists resented the power and perks of Connecticut's Congregationalist clergy, and Jefferson resented the fact that Congregationalists attacked him as a radical and a freethinker. The believers and the freethinker made common cause against other believers. Religious freedom means freedom to argue about religion, and it's still going on.